So our next presenter is Dr. Lisa Murray, who is the city of Sydney historian. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Peter. So when Peter actually started talking with me about the pneumonic influenza, I really jumped at the opportunity to see what might be held in the city archives. A historical event like this, which moves across government jurisdictions, is a challenging thing to research, and I was really curious to discover what records might survive and how they might reflect the City Council's response. So the City of Sydney Archives holds records created by Sydney Municipal Council and the records date from 1842 through to the present. So one of the things to understand about the City Archives collection is that it also includes the records of municipal council areas that have been amalgamated with the City of Sydney over the years. And a few years ago, if I sort of said the City of Sydney was amalgamated, people get confused, but we've all pretty much experienced council amalgamations here in metropolitan Sydney now. So you all know that council boundaries can change. So we also, the City of Sydney archives also holds records of former municipal councils of Camperdown, Newtown, Erskineville, Glebe, Redfern, Alexandria and Waterloo and later on South Sydney Council. So that's important to remember. So the way to start researching the City of Sydney Archives collection is on our website. You can go to the home page and search, select the learn area and um, go to search our collections which is where all our different catalogues are and the key ones that most people would use are Archive Picks, which is our digitised photographic collection, and Archives Investigator, which is all of the council files and records. So they're the two sort of main collections to search. We have lots of other specific records that have been digitised. That's all fantastic. <laughs> Get even more excited because in about just under 12 months, we're going to have a brand new catalogue system which we're all getting very excited about at the City Council that will allow us to search and integrate and get to digitise records even more quickly. So that's something to look forward to. But in the meantime, go to search our collection. So you can do a keyword search on influenza, for example, but that will only pull up material with the word influenza in the title. And some of our records, because we're a government archive, they're not sort of listed down to that very detailed level. So with a government archive such as the City of Sydney Archives, it's really important to think about the functions and activities of council. So what they did, what, the, what departments might have existed to oversee these activities, and the types of records that might have been created by these departments. So there's no point coming to the City of Sydney archives expecting to find a personal family letter between, you know, someone who lived in Alexandria writing to someone who lived in Down at the Rocks, telling them about the influenza that they experienced. Because they're not the type of records we hold. You've got to remember we're a municipal council. So, in thinking about the City archives, I already had a few leads because I knew that in 1919 the City Council had a City Health Officer. This is Dr James Purdy. He was the City Health Officer between 1913 and 1936. And he actually had a dual role under the Public Health Act of 1902. The City and Metropolitan Suburbs were designated as health districts. and so. He was both the city health officer and the district medical officer for wider Sydney metropolitan area. And at the City of Sydney, he oversaw the city health and sanitation department. So in terms of our records, I had to think about there could be reports or correspondence from the city health officer to the town clerk and the mayor telling them about what's going on in terms of the city. Of course, not every municipal council at this time may have had a city health officer, but they all would have had sanitation departments. And so they all would have had someone who was reporting to the council about the health of their local area. So think about that if you're thinking about your municipal area. Now, pneumonic influenza was declared a notifiable infectious diseases. So there's all sorts of diseases that 
the sanitation departments used to keep an eye on and report on. But there were only set diseases that were thought to be particularly communicable and infectious, but there's only a certain number. And so the pneumonic influenza was listed as such. And so all local councils were expected to report every case that they were notified about. So as a result, all municipal councils had to keep infectious diseases registers. And so cases of pneumonic influenza would be listed in that. So I definitely needed to check if there were any registers surviving. So that was something else to look for in the records. And if, so there's a clear example where just doing a keyword search on influenza wouldn't pull up the infectious diseases register. So that's why you've got to think laterally when you're doing your research. Now, I also knew that the pneumonic influenza epidemic fell within the reign of Thomas Nesbitt, the town clerk. And he wrote comprehensive annual reports on all the major decisions, public works and events that happened every year. So I was pretty sure that the annual report of 1919 for the City Council would be a good starting point to get an overview of the Council's response to the influenza outbreak. The town clerk was a great administrator and he kept tabs on all the correspondence and also all the media coverage. So the town clerk's department correspondence folders, CRS 34, and the town clerk's <laughs> news clipping books, which is CRS 1083, both of which have been comprehensively listed by volunteers in our Archive Investigator catalogue. They should contain a whole lot of material. So I was pretty confident by typing in influenza, I would probably get a lot from those two collections. So that was just thinking about anticipating what might I find and where can I start looking. So what was their response? Well. Imperial and global communications via telegraph and newspapers ensured that everyone knew the disease was coming. The Lord Mayor and the City Health Officer were involved in various meetings with the State Government. The Town Clerk was in regular communication with the Department of Public Health from late 1918. And on the 10th of November 1918, the Lord Mayor, under delegation of Council, approved the free distribution of disinfectant without discrimination to all ratepayers. So this was their first decision, you know, anticipating that this influenza was going to make it to Australia's shores. There was a lot of publicity and discussion of the impending health crisis in the newspapers, especially in January and February of 1919. And the town clerk's news clipping books document on a day-to-day -day basis the newspaper coverage. So while we're all familiar and love the National Library's digitised newspapers through Trove, which allows us to search widely across newspapers across Australia, the news clipping volumes in the city archives and similar records which are held, held elsewhere are a way of getting into that sort of mindset of the day because they're capturing every article of interest across the newspapers. So they basically get all the newspapers that were published in Sydney and they go through it and they're like, what's of interest to us? What's, is go what's impacting on us? What's in our local area? And they clip it out and they put it together. So you can really see over time how the coverage changes and have that as a sort of blow by blow. And this relentless coverage would have really, I think, heightened the public's anxiety around the sort of this impending outbreak. Of course, it didn't help that the state government itself actually vacillated in its preventative measures and regulations, causing ongoing confusion about what quarantine rules should be followed. And you can see this in the news clippings, like there's talk about masks, people should wear masks, then a doctor gets published in the newspapers, no masks don't do any good. And then, they, and then the state government declares mask day where everyone has to wear their mask in public. So there's this real kind of like what, what to do and, and you really get that. And I think as family historians, community historians, this can give us with our imagination <coughs> quite an understanding of the impact of this, this outbreak. 
Now, several of the aldermen were very frustrated with the response of the federal government and the Victorian government, who they blamed for allowing the spread of influenza to New South Wales. And this is something that Peter touched on earlier. They weren't, they're not really sure how it got here, but they think it came through Victoria and then up into New South Wales. Well, there was a protest motion debated in February 1919, just as the sort of influenza was breaking out here in Sydney. And they put a protest motion, was put forward by Lindsay Thompson, and it was that the council enter its emphatic protest to the federal authorities and state authorities of Victoria for their ineptitude, neglect, and partiality in dealing with the pneumonic scourge, endangering, as it did, the lives and avocations of our citizens. And then there was an amendment. So if you know council procedure, someone can put a motion forward and then someone says, no, no, we have to say this as well. So Alderman Doyle goes, and further protests against the inane and drastic restrictions imposed indiscriminately upon the people by the New South Wales government, thereby causing unemployment, which renders the people insufficiently nourished against the spread of the disease. So there was much debate in the council chamber around this, but ultimately both motions did not have a majority, and so neither of them were okay. Both motions were lost. But what this shows you is the frustrations felt amongst our civic leaders about their inability to curb the spread of the disease or provide a surefire cure. They are really wanting to kind of be the protectors of their communities. They're the civic leaders. People are expecting them to be able to help them. And they felt frustrated with these other levels of government, as always. This is, this is an ongoing story within local government, this tension between local government and state government, particularly at the city of Sydney and its relationship with the state government. So the Lord Mayor of Sydney was a political figurehead and so even though the public res health response was being coordinated by the state government, the city council received many pieces of correspondence from the public, sharing formulas for cures, touting for business in the supply of disinfectants and other medical miracles and offering their assistance in the health crisis. So we heard from all sorts of citizens. There was a fantastic letter which I didn't reproduce because it went on and on and on from a mad citizen in New Zealand who claimed to have cured himself and also his cat from, <laughs> from the flu. So that was kind of interesting, and, and, and the city health officer wrote it marginally. Mm, yes, no. <laughs> <coughs> Here's another visitor, Hugh Olgavy, who was a versatile Scotch comedian, and he shared a remedy from a doctor in Chicago. And on this time, with the other letters that are on the file, we find that the Lord Mayor actually published this remedy in the local papers in April to share a simple remedy of something that people could maybe do to help relieve symptoms. <clears throat> because as we heard in the oral histories, there was no aspro back then. So also, they were touting for, a lot of people were touting for business. And so, for instance, the council received letters from people like Harris Orchard Sprays and Disinfectants, who wrote in February 1919, um, particularly spruiking their disinfectant, Miracle. We have been favoured with a large repeat orders from many of the suburban and country municipalities, but we have not, up to the present, had the pleasure of supplying your council. We take this opportunity of requesting a trial order. Well, the city health officer advised the town clerk in this case in the marginalia, influenza is spread chiefly by droplets from person to person direct and not by the intermediary of inanimate objects, so that the use of disinfectants is not advocated other than as gargles or nose sprays. And the order was not placed. <laughs> Another company had more success. A flyer promoting psyllin was sent to the council, and from the associated marginalia, it appears that council placed an order for this product. And I think this is a, this poster is a really fascinating because it's actually providing much broader advice about how to stay healthy and to fight the flu. It's sort of talking about that prevention is better than cure and doing things like keep cool and also do not worry. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice with its high anxiety. 
So the proclamation by the state government in February 1919, closing various businesses and places of amusement, was inconvenient and caused much consternation. And we can see that from the protest earlier. The Archbishop of Sydney from the Church of England wrote to the Lord Mayor, noting that the Sydney Diocese had responded to this closure. He reported that they disbanded the schools immediately, that the school buildings would be placed at the disposal of the civil authorities, and that all of the Anglican Church stand prepared to regulate church functions as required by public orders. Why they bothered to write to the Lord Mayor to say all of this really just again shows the Lord Mayor being a figurehead. It you know really doesn't make any difference to the City Council how the church responded to this as it was a state government proclamation. But also they wanted, I guess, to share their religious fervour with the broader citizenry because they also told the Lord Mayor that moreover we are all prepared and eager to assist in every way called for by this grave visitation of divine providence. <laughs> the Lord Mayor responded expressing his sincere appreciation of the <coughs> resolution passed by your diocesan synod at its meeting yesterday. Your promise of cooperation and assistance is greatly appreciated and will, I'm sure, afford a very excellent example for all sections of the community to follow. So this idea of sort of civic leadership and encouraging people to do the right thing. Of course, the city council itself had to close various things, including the library. So the city librarian um, complied, closing, closing the library's reading rooms at various times and reopening again as, as they could. And when they did reopen, it was noted that patrons were required to wear masks and to stand at a certain distance apart. It was about two feet. So as you went to borrow your book, you had to be two feet away from everyone else around you wearing your mask. So just imagine trying to borrow your library books. And the town clerk railed against this proclamation. He was extremely annoyed by it because he described it as high-handed, illegal action, taking in compulsory closing certain places of business and amusements in relation to the outbreak of the pneumonic influenza. He claimed that many well-informed persons entertained serious doubts and misgivings as to le the legality of this proclamation. And the council was starting to get approached by people who rented property from the council that was, you know, halls and places of amusement and so on, and were wanting to see rental relief because they couldn't operate their businesses, they had to close. But the council was really wary of the state government's promises for compensation. The town clerk had seen it all before, promises by the state government for financial relief that never came through. And so he advised the council not to provide any rent relief for affected businesses until the legislation by the state government was passed. And so we do have several correspondence files um, in our archives that are kind of dealing with this issue of rent relief. The Municipal Employees Union was equally concerned about the health of staff. A delegation visited the Lord Mayor to request that masks be purchased for staff. And similarly, the Federated Electrical Trades Union of Australia met with the Lord Mayor to represent staff, expressing their real fear of infection as they dealt with the public on a day-to-day -day basis. And they requested that an inhalation chamber be built. And as a result of all these representations, the council bought 2,500 masks to be issued to staff. As several of members of the electrical department actually contracted influenza, the first inhalation chamber was put in the courtyard next to the electric light building um, at Town Hall. And subsequently, three other inhalation chambers were built at Town Hall, on some steps leading into the main hall, at the central powerhouse at Ultimo, and the municipal garage and workshop at Palmer Street. But they only operated for a few short months before they were discontinued on medical advice as being basically ineffective. Despite these precautions, at least three staff that we know of from the electric lighting department were diagnosed with pneumonic influenza. And sadly, shift electrician Mullins died on the 23rd of March in 1919. So this was a clear indication of the risks of staff doing their job and the risk of them contracting it. So the council passed several resolutions to ensure that the staff suffering from the flu 
received pay. Originally proportional sick pay was passed, but then they decided in July 1919, as the epidemic continued, that staff will get a full pay allowances for the whole time they were absent from duty as a consequence of the flu. And this was retrospectively applied from the 1st of January 1919. So it covered the entire sort of period of the epidemic. So that was, um, for that time, quite a compassionate kind of resolution. They also used the lower town hall as an inoculation depot. And they were thinking about, the councillors were concerned and thinking they should ramp up house to house inspections, but the city health officer argued that this was actually business as usual and happened. So not to, there wasn't any benefit in actually ramping this process up. The council was particularly concerned with the sanitary inspectors because they were at the frontier of the fight against influenza. And so the council took out life insurance for the city health officer and six sanitary inspectors. Now there were 13 depots established by the state government across the city, one in each of the city wards. And six officers from um, the health and sanitary department were, actually, were among the nurses and medical officers detailed for special duty at the depots. Workers at these depots had to investigate every reported or suspected case, inspecting the house and identifying contacts. And in recognition of their dedication and working overtime, each of the sanitary officers who worked in the depots were granted a £10 bonus at the end of the epidemic. So just finally to show you the impact. So I did look for those infectious diseases registers for the City of Sydney but they don't appear to have survived. They're not held in the archives. However, the City Health Officer's monthly reports in 1919 did provide statistics for notifiable diseases. And so I could actually find out the number of cases and the number of deaths in the City of Sydney. And so here is a graph that is showing you, uh, compiled from each of the monthly reports of the number of notified cases in each month over 1919, and then the and then the number of deaths. And so you can see there's a big peak in within the City of Sydney local government area in April, and then another peak in June. And the deaths continued to be notified right up until December of 1919. And in terms of the total number of cases reported was 1,902, and the number of deaths recorded was 679. There was also a breakdown of the cases by wards published in the annual report, and that allowed me to see the spread of the disease across the area. So it was presented in this sort of tabulated format. But then what I was able to do was then take a map of the city of Sydney and actually put the numbers across each of the wards. So you could see, so again, this is notifiable cases. This is the number of cases of people who suffered. So, Again, it, it's reasonably well spread. There's just one area down around um, Circular Quay, which has a much lower amount, but when you look at the ward and the definition, actually half of it's the government domain and botanic garden. So it sort of wouldn't have had as high a population on a day-to-day -day basis there, and a lot of the other people there would have been sort of, I guess, office workers and things, not, you know, it's not a high residential area, that particular ward. Just to very last thing is to just touch on um, other sort of municipalities. The annual report of the Department of Health actually provides a table on the number of cases and death rates for all municipalities around the state. So there was every year, the Department of Health publishes an annual report and of course their report published in 1920 covering the year of 1919 had all the usual things including all the notifiable diseases and then also had a special section at the back, a special report specifically on the influenza pandemic. But these figures are actually in the main part of the report because it was something that they had to report on every year, notifiable diseases. So while you might think you have to go to the inf special influenza report, that's actually looking more at the tracking the sort of epidemiology of how it all developed. These are just the sort of raw stats. And just to pull up a couple of other inner city councils, 
that we have records for. It was always said that Alexandria was very affected by the influenza epidemic, particularly amongst the children. And we can't, from these particular figures, say with certainty, you know, what the cases were. But when you compare the death rate to some of the surrounding areas, in fact, its neighbouring municipality of Waterloo had a higher death rate than Alexandria. So that's an interesting thing to look at, given the discussion in many of the historical papers say that Alexandria suffered quite badly. So that's an area of research. We heard in the oral histories that Erskineville, you know, the memory is that Erskineville didn't have that many cases. And there it's saying Erskineville only had 87 cases. So it looks like it's not doing too bad. But when you do that proportionally and work out the death rate, it's fairly similar to other areas. So again, that's something interesting to kind of drill down into more, whether they, the population that they were getting that death rate from looked to me like it was very small. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. So it's always important to interrogate your statistical evidence. And even though it's in an official report from 1919, to still go, OK, so why are they going on that? That seems a bit unusual. It's also unusual when I actually compare it to the Infectious Diseases Register, which survives for Erskineville and survives for Paddington. So I had two lots of Infectious Diseases Registers to look at. There are only 47 cases of the disease in Erskineville's register. So when I first looked at that, I was like, there really isn't many cases being registered. But then another 40 are officially put to Erskineville. So that's something, again, to have a bit of a look at. So this is what the Infectious Diseases Register looks at. It's quite a large document. And it's really interesting sort of to trace that intimate pandemic, which Peter was talking about. What it means is that it shows when the case was reported, the patient's name, the gender, the age, the address of where the person is at the time of the report as well as the address of the attack so that way hopefully through the registers they might get information to be able to track contacts and, and, and the spread of the disease but you know what this allows us to do especially in cases where most people are actually being nursed at home that you can actually get a sense of where people are in the municipality and you can start trying to explore individual experiences of the pandemic. So there's some of the records that are held at the city archives and I hope that gives you some insight into the types of things you can explore when looking at municipal records in relation to the um, pneumonic influenza pandemic.